Hello and welcome back to another video in the Introduction to Windows Forensics series. In this episode, we're going to do a bit of cooking. Okay, not really. That could be dangerous, especially if I'm the one doing the cooking. We're going to look at a self-contained HTML-based tool called CyberChef. Reading from the project's GitHub page, CyberChef is a simple, intuitive web app for carrying out all manner of cyber operations within a web browser. These operations include simple encoding like XOR or Base64, more complex encryption like AES, DES, and Blowfish, creating binary and hex dumps, compression and decompression of data, calculating hashes and checksums, IPv6 and X509 parsing, changing character encodings, and much more. The tool is designed to enable both technical and non-technical analysts the ability to manipulate data in complex ways without having to deal with complex tools or algorithms. It was conceived, designed, built, and incrementally improved by an analyst in their 10% innovation time over several years. Every effort has been made to structure the code in a readable and extendable format, however it should be noted that the analyst is not a professional developer. So this tool is actually made available from GCHQ, Government Communications Headquarters, which is the intelligence and security organization responsible for SIGINT, Signals Intelligence, and IA, Information Assurance, in the United Kingdom. Think of this as the British equivalent of the NSA. As I mentioned, CyberChef is completely self-contained. It's literally a single HTML file. And by that, I mean that you can download this and use it completely offline. And even though this episode falls under the Windows Forensic series, this tool is truly platform agnostic and can be used on just about any OS and any modern web browser. In the next section of the video, we'll look at some of the tool's functionality and look at some of the tools within CyberChef that I find to be most interesting and most useful. And then in the last and final section of the video, we'll actually take a look at some recipes that were created by other analysts that will enable a workflow of actions to automate a particular process. So let's get started. And this is CyberChef. Now you'll notice in the URL bar that I'm actually looking at an online demo version hosted on github.io, but in the top left, you'll see a link to download CyberChef. So let's go ahead and click that, and we'll save the cyberchef.htm file to the desktop. Now let's go ahead and launch that. And now we have a completely self-contained version of the tool, which can be used offline. You'll notice that we're using version 7.11.1s, the last build says a month ago. If we click on about slash support, we can get some additional information here as well. Also in the top right, we have options where we can change the theme. We can change it to dark, for example, which looks pretty cool, or GeoCities, which does not look very cool. Let's go ahead and change it back to classic. That'll be easiest to see in the video. There are several other options here that I rarely change, but it's good to know that they exist. On the left side, we have an operations column, which is where all of the tools functionality is located. You'll notice we have a search blank, so we can search for a particular function. And we have a favorites section, which is pre-populated by default. We can certainly add to this list as well. Now, I'm going to briefly cover some of the most useful, or at least in my opinion, most useful functionality. But I'm certainly not going to look at every single option available here because the video would literally be well over an hour. So at the top, we see to and from base64. Obviously, this is something that is very commonly used. If I click on to base64, for example, you notice that it added it to the recipe section. I can type in hello world, and you'll notice the output here is indeed the base64 value. So if I turn that off and then double click from base64, I can type this in, and of course it decodes it back to hello world. Now this is nothing exciting or new, obviously there are plenty of ways to do this, but it is useful, especially in combination with a recipe or workflow of events here. 
We also have various other things like to and from hex and to and from hex dump. URL decode, that's very useful for decoding the percent values that we often see in URLs. We even have a regular expression or regex section, which is useful. Under data format, there are a ton of things here, as you can see. That's actually where you'll find the from and to base 64 sections that we saw in favorites. Also base 32, base 58. There's the URL encoding and decoding, escape Unicode characters. Again, just a huge amount of functionality. Under encryption and encoding, we have various types of encryption algorithms and ciphers. You'll even notice things like ROT13 here, which is just a simple substitution cipher. By the way, if you mouse over any of these things, you get a nice detailed description, as you can see here. As we continue to scroll down under public key, we have some PKI, public key crypto options here. Under arithmetic and logic, we have some XOR and various other functions here. Networking is quite useful. We can parse various IP address ranges, as well as IPv6 and IPv4 headers. We can even change IP address formats, as you can see here. Under language, we can encode and decode text, as you can see here. Notice all of the supported character sets. Under utils, we have diff. Remove white space, which is pretty cool. We can actually paste in a bunch of data here and it will clean it up for us and remove the spaces, carriage returns, line feeds, etc. We can convert text to upper or lower case. And again, any of these, I just double click on and it adds it to the recipe. If I type in any option here, you'll notice, of course, that it converts it to uppercase. We can convert to lowercase, add line numbers, remove line numbers. Again, this is all self-explanatory, but just look at the vast amount of different options we have here. Date and time is certainly an interesting section. This is something that is extremely important in forensics, as you know. We have to make sure our time zone conversions are correct. You'll notice here we have from Unix timestamp and to Unix timestamp. We even have Windows file time, which again is the 64-bit value that represents hundreds of nanoseconds elapsed since January the 1st, 1601 UTC, which of course, if you've watched the previous videos in the Introduction to Windows Forensic series, you'll know that is a very common value used in Windows. Under extractors, we can extract IP addresses from a given amount of text here. We can extract email addresses and MAC addresses and URLs, domains, and various other things from given input. We can even extract EXIF data, which is pretty cool. Now again, we could use EXIF tool or other things to do that, but just the fact that we can have this all in a web-based interface is pretty awesome. Again, especially when you combine it into a recipe or workflow. Under compression, we have raw deflate and inflate. Zlib, deflate and inflate, gzip, various other things. Under hashing, we have a wide variety of hashing algorithms here. Code tidy is an interesting section. We can actually highlight things in syntax, and we can also beautify given code, which is pretty cool. So it will basically align the code and make it look nice. So again, that doesn't really have forensic implications necessarily, but it is something that's very handy. Under other, we have quite a few options as well, including the option to remove EXIF data from a given input or extract the EXIF data. And then lastly, under flow control, we have several additional options as well. So as you can see, this is a large amount of functionality built into this HTML file. Now, if we actually take a look at the file, I'll go ahead and open it with Sublime, you'll notice that it is huge. In fact, it's around six megabytes. And if we actually look at the code here on the right, you'll notice that a lot of work went into this to be able to add all of this functionality. As I scroll through here, you'll just notice, again, how big this is. But again, it's just a simple HTML file 
the end of the day that we can use in a completely offline fashion, which is awesome. So in the next and final section of the video, we'll actually take a look at some pre-built recipes that other analysts have created that will enable us to do all sorts of things. So let's take a look at that next. If you've watched other episodes in the Introduction to Windows Forensics series, you may have seen RDP Event Log Forensics. In that video, we took a look at event logs present on an RDP connection target for a wide variety of RDP events, such as log on, log off, etc. I'm working on a future video that will cover RDP event logs present on the initiator of an RDP connection, and in one of those logs, event ID 1029, the username is encoded in a very odd manner. In fact, get this, it's a base64 encoded SHA-256 hash of a UTF-16 Little Indian encoded username. Yeah, so why? I don't know, but possibly for privacy reasons, so that the username you're using to connect to a remote resource is not stored in plain text in the logs of the connecting system. My colleague Mike Peterson of nullsec.us was researching this and discovered that a CyberChef recipe had been created to automate this decoding process. You're looking at the recipe, which as you can see, contains five ingredients or operations. If we enter a username that we suspect would be present in the logs, in specifically event ID 1029, such as Davis RG, you'll notice that CyberChef automatically bakes it for us and provides the encoded username in the output section, as you can see here. Now, by the way, the reason why this automatically generated the output is because the auto bake checkbox is checked by default. If you uncheck that box, then you can manually click the green bake button each time to actually run the operations listed in the recipe. So what we can do is compare the output to what we see in the logs and see if we have a match. Now, obviously, we can't take the base64 encoded value, decode it, get the SHA-256 hash, and then somehow reverse the hash and get back to the username because, of course, by its very definition, a hash is a one-way mathematical operation. But if I suspect that, for example, the username was DavisRG, I could take this particular hash and then look in the logs and see if it matched. Here you are looking at an excerpt of RDP logs, and this happens to be an event ID 1029 event. At the bottom, you'll see base64 SHA-256 username is, and then this string. The string starts with capital W, capital A, and it ends with capital E and an equal for padding. Obviously, this does not match our output. But what if I suspected that this was actually the administrator account? So I typed in administrator. Now you'll notice the output starts with capital W, capital A, and it ends with capital E equals. This is indeed the same value. So now I can conclude that the username within this log is actually administrator. So when I was thinking of real world scenarios and recipes that I could show you, this is the first thing that came to mind because we've actually used this. It is kind of a convoluted example, but if you had to manually try to de-obfuscate this username as it's listed in the logs, it would be quite difficult. But with a simple CyberChef recipe, it's pretty easy. So next we're going to look at another recipe that could come in handy as well. Okay, this is a simpler example, but it could still come in very handy. Here you'll notice that I've created a recipe with three ingredients. The first ingredient is extract IP addresses. I'm guessing you probably know what that does. You'll notice that IPv4 is checked, IPv6 is unchecked, remove local IPv4 addresses is checked, which means it will filter out RFC 1918 addresses, and display total is checked, meaning that the total count of found IP addresses will be displayed. Next, we have a unique operation that will take the data set and deduplicate it. The delimiter is set to line feed. Now that does mean that if you had two addresses on the same line that were the same, 
it would not deduplicate them because it's delimiting on line feed. However, we do have plenty of other options available here. And then lastly, we are sorting by IP address, which is pretty interesting, which means it will actually sort ascending from the lowest first octet to the largest. The delimiter here is also line feed. Now this could come in handy if we have a data set and we want to extract IP addresses from that data set. One common use of this may be an email header, which I happen to have here. So let's take this email header, copy it, and paste it into the input. And you'll notice that it automatically baked it for us and we have four IP addresses that have been extracted from the header. So again, this is only IPv4, but I could just as easily enable IPv6. I am filtering out RFC 1918 addresses, but I don't necessarily have to. I am displaying the total. If I want to turn that off, for example, just uncheck the box and it will automatically update. I am deduplicating the addresses based on the line feed delimiter, and I am then sorting them. If I didn't want to sort them, for example, it will actually display them in the order they were found. So if we scroll up to the top of the header, you'll notice that indeed 209.85.217.174 was the first found address. And then the next found address was here in X originating IP. So again, this is another real world example that could come in handy for you. And by the way, as a side note, check out Abibus if something like this interests you. Abibus is a Python script available on the 13 cubed GitHub page, which I'll link to in the description. It performs the same actions you see here, but it also obtains GeoIP information for each found address. So that could come in handy for you. Now, I could literally go on for hours as far as all of the possibilities of useful CyberChef recipes. I mean, the possibilities are endless. But I'll spare you the time. I think you probably get the point by now and hopefully you see the value in this very powerful tool. Oh, and one more thing, any readers of XKCD out there? CyberChef also generates random numbers. Just type in XKCD and you'll actually see XKCD random number. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, take a look at XKCD 221. Sorry, I couldn't resist. So that wraps up this video. I hope you've enjoyed learning about CyberChef. The interface is very intuitive and easy to use, and I encourage you to check it out for yourself. Also, if you develop or otherwise find any useful recipes, please consider sharing them by posting in the comments below. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to watch this episode. I hope you found it useful and informative and enjoyable. And as always, please like, subscribe, and share. And I'll catch you in the next one.